Well, welcome everybody. My name is Christian Talbot. I am the president of the Middle States Association of Colleges and Schools for the Commissions on Elementary and Secondary Education. And I am thrilled that you have joined us today for our conversation with Michael Horn. I wanna say a little bit about uh, why we're here, what success will look like and how the conversation will go before I introduce Michael. Um, I know we have people from all around the world, from our schools and, uh, and friends and we're uh, really excited to have different voices in this conversation. And that's part of why we're here. We're here because as you know, I hope from our last conversation together, that this year is the year of the Middle States Network. And we want to be able to bring to you really rewarding thought leadership that may shape your work. And specifically today, uh, if we are successful, or maybe I should say when we are successful, uh, you will develop a keener understanding of what the landscape looks like around school evolution. And there's no one better to talk about that than Michael Horn. So today will be a really simple format. I will interview Michael for a little while, and then maybe for about 20 minutes at the end, uh, we'll do some Q&A. You'll be able to put your questions into the chat, and someone from the Middle States staff will filter those questions to me, uh, and I will pose them to Michael. So let me introduce Michael. Uh, you already know about Michael from the invitation to this event. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, were already familiar with him um, because of his reputation in the education industry. Um, and that means you already know he's one of our most prominent educational leaders and researchers and writers and thinkers. But I wanna say a little bit about why it was so important to me personally and why his work has been so important to me personally and why I felt it was uh, a really good idea to bring him into conversation with all of Middle States. So I've been following Michael's work since the publication of Disrupting Class, which he, he co-wrote with Clayton Christensen, uh, the late, great Clayton Christensen. And as someone who has been a teacher, an administrator, a, uh, a trustee in schools for the last 25 years, I paid special attention when Michael joined the Board of Trustees for the National Association of Independent Schools. I wasn't surprised when shortly after that, uh, NAIS started publishing some research around jobs to be done, which is a key aspect of, of work that Michael and his colleagues have done at the Christensen Institute. And a couple of years ago, at the start of the pandemic, I noted that Michael and his colleague, um, Diane Tabiner, started talking about the impact of the pandemic on education and where things were going. Michael started a Substack, which I subscribed to immediately. And I knew that I was going to have a front row seat to some of the most important and best thinking about this real time experiment that we've all lived through in the last couple of years as educators in a pandemic. And so from his work with that late great Clayton Christensen on disruptive innovation and on jobs to be done, uh, to his ongoing application of those theories, which you can read about if you go to the Christensen Institute website. Uh, he has these great dialogues with another person I'm a huge fan of, Jeff Salingo, on the future of higher education, uh, which links very much to the conversation we're going to have today, and so much more. As I said, Michael is, in my estimation, one of the most important education thinkers out there. And I read a lot uh, and when I, when I read this book, I was so struck by it that I, I actually reread it. I almost never reread anything, but I read this book twice. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you that I took a lot of notes. So those are post-it notes and inside on any given page, there are a lot of highlights and, and things that I've written in the margins because for me, this book is the single best thing I have read about mapping the transformation process for schools. So I wanna say a huge thank you to Michael Horn for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with you over the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes or so. I, just a deep honor for me to join you and, and thank you for that praise. I'm, I'm sure I'm not worth it, but uh, I'm, I'm just excited to be with y'all. So th thank you. Well, thank you again, Michael. And you've earned the praise many times over. So I thought I would divide the interview part of, of our conversation into, into three sections. And these are three kind of high level themes that resonated for me as I was reading the book and taking notes on our conversation today. The first big theme, and that's where we'll start, is around change leadership and strategy. If not everybody, almost everybody on this call today is someone who either has led change 
or is in the process of leading change or aspires to lead change in schools. And there's a human side to that. There's a, there's a strategy side to that. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that as a big, a big bucket of themes. Um, the second theme will be around systems and models. And, and again, in, in my estimation, I have, I have not read a book that does a better job of laying out all the different systems and elements of the system, uh, as well as mental models for thinking about how to work within that system. And then the third big theme is a, is a kind of a golden thread throughout this book and so many of your, uh, your blog posts and your articles for, for Forbes, for the Christensen Institute and, and other places, and that's around mastery-based learning. But let's start with this first theme of, of change leadership and strategy. And um, Michael, as you know, I've, I've written a number of blog posts already, and there are a few more that are teed up to come out over the next few weeks about your book. Uh, and in my first review of From Reopen to Reinvent, I characterized it as an atlas of the change journey for schools. And I'm curious, did you intend to do that? Was that what you were actually up to? Well, I'll, I'll say up front, I think this is why you have people who are external to you actually build the publicity uh, for ideas rather than the originator, because I never thought of that word. But I, I think it's a really great word to connote what I wanted to do, which was more than anything else I've written, I wanted it to be a prescriptive take on here are a few things that I think we ought to do yesterday, but we ought to really look at seriously right now. And you noted, you know, mastery-based learning, uh, team teaching, creating more supports for teachers, better understanding the progress that parents want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's part of the book, right? Like this is where I think we ought to be going in a much more directed way than I have historically. But I also wanted people to give them tools to get there, the compass and the map and, and, and how you actually move complicated systems where people don't agree, where, you know, you're in school environments and, you know, you have different factions uh, and, and, and folks thinking that, that we ought to be moving toward different things, or they haven't heard of certain concepts that maybe you want to do uh, with students and, and the learning and so forth. And so give people a way of change management at the same time that would say, hey, maybe I don't like Michael's prescriptions, or I disagree with this thing that he thinks is a really good idea, or, or it doesn't work for my community, right? Like in this community, I can see why he would say that, think that made sense, but here it doesn't. But I want to do this, and Michael's book has still given me a way to chart progress and, and to innovate in a very complex ecosystem toward that. And that, that was sort of the hope for the book is that, you know, we had this giant pause uh, with a lot of devastation. And I, I heard a lot of people, a lot of educators saying, we don't want to go back to normal. I see a lot of people going back to normal right now, and I wanted them to have a way to not slip back and, and do something better and greater for uh, the world's you know future generation that's going to lead us, the, our students. Well, I, I think you succeeded on that front. In that same first review that I wrote of the book, I described my initial reaction to reading this book, which was, this is the book I needed a decade ago when I first uh, became a head of school and had a fairly clear picture of what I wanted the school to look like, but had no idea uh, it was just an entirely blank spot on my my mental map of how to get there. And so, again, I think you've done a, a really wonderful job of providing an atlas, not just one map, but multiple maps uh, that, that school leaders can use to navigate that journey. In your many conversations with school leaders um, and, and systems leaders, I'm curious if you've noticed a couple of bigger obstacles than, than usual or really big boulders when it comes to the development of strategy. There's obviously the, the, the kind of the hand-to-hand -hand combat of leading change, but, but before that happens, there has to be the formulation of strategy. What do you notice is, is the biggest impediment or the couple of biggest impediments to formulating strategy in schools? Gosh, that's a great question, uh, Christian. Um, I think the biggest one is that strategy isn't just the art of knowing what to do, it's the art of knowing what not to do or what we're gonna be bad at. And making trade-offs, not in a negative way, like we're settling, but viewing trade-offs as something we intentionally choose so that we decide what we get to be excellent at and who we're gonna serve and help them make progress. That is, I think, one of the biggest barriers historically that I've seen to really good strategy processes is that we are not intentional, deliberate, 
an embracing of the things we won't do anymore, the things we will choose not to be or not to do. I think the the second one that I see, frankly, is that it, it's paired with that, which is that we often want to be one size fits all places. We want all comers and you know, the best schools, it drives me nuts sometimes, you know, my, my, my kids go to a wonderful independent school and it drives me nuts occasionally when they have to say to a family, you know, you're really, we just want to do what's in your kid's best interest. This isn't the right fit for them. And I actually think that's the best statement a school can make in many cases is to say, it's not that we don't love your child. It's not that we don't want to serve them, but we're just not the best place for it. We're clear about where we are and let us help you find the best place, right, uh, for, for, for your child. So that as a system, we can do what's right for each kid. Uh, but in trying to be one size fits all places often, I think we uh, lose the clarity around what we are best positioned to do to our detriment um, some, sometimes. So if I had to name two, I think that would be it. The, the two throwaway ones, I'll just add to that if I get two more. One would be having true clarity around the vision of what we want to be. I think sometimes we don't have that clear vision in place that is in plain English that everyone really understands. We use a lot of buzzwords. And that relates to the last one, which is we all talk in language and jargon that we think other people understand, but we're really talking past each other in a lot of cases. And, and, and we don't mean the same thing. And we don't have that ruthless dedication to being clear about what we mean when we communicate. Yeah, that resonates really strongly for me. And, and I'm sure others on this, on this webinar know that there are so many different stakeholders and it's very hard to say no to some of those stakeholders yes. that we're not going to be that kind of school. Uh, and I've, I've also noticed in consulting to many, many schools that there's a real resistance at the board level to thinking of strategy as something more than laundry listing all the things that the school wants to do, which is very different from having a coherent unifying vision for a direction and a, and a destination. Uh, and I don't know if you have any further thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it was just off of what you just said, it, it occurs to me, and I can't remember where I read this recently, but priorities uh, used to be a singular word only, priority, right? And it, it meant one thing. Um, and I, I remember a, uh, this wasn't, an, this was a school superintendent. They said, these are our priorities for the year. And she went on to list 30 things. <laughs> if you have 30 priorities, you have no priorities. You know, it, you really need to be focused. And so it, just building off what you said there. Yeah. And it, later on in this conversation, we'll come around to the connection with, uh, with jobs to be done because we can't be everything to everyone. And so it, it, there's a greater imperative for us to understand the kinds of progress that, that families are trying to make when they enroll their kids in a public school, a private school, or some other kind of school. Yeah. The, the challenge for the leader of, of a, a system, you know, like a superintendent, as you just man, message, uh, ma, um, mentioned rather, or a principal or a head of school, um, or even a division head, uh, that challenge can be overwhelming. And I, I'm curious if you've noticed in your career that some leaders tend to practice a certain set of behaviors that are really effective in helping them to get their community to go along with change, even when there might be some initial resistance? Love the question. And I, I, it's worth reflecting more on this one, I think. Uh, but the quick observation I would say is the leaders, they, they don't necessarily come in with the vision themselves, right? The vision can come from lots of places, but they develop deep clarity and passion around what that vision is. That's number one, I think. Number two, they they assess the organization to understand what its real capabilities are, what its different interests are, and they're adaptive or flexible in what tools they use to get there. So let me give you an example of what it's not sometimes, which is you get the leader who comes in deep vision about where they want to go, clarity, they want a clean house, they sort of have this they're refreshingly clear. We kind of like it, right? I, I, I'm drawn to it often as well. Uh, but they're not super effective at leading, which I define as the art of moving a group of followers toward a goal within a context. And 
I, I think to do that, you have to realize that the quickest point or the quickest path between two two dots, right, isn't always a straight line. It isn't always being clear. It isn't always being uh, blunt and, you know, taking that ax, right? It's, it's zigging and zagging. It's innovating with. It's getting other people to come up with the ideas themselves. It's, it's all these different tools depending on changing circumstance. I, I would say get into this. Uh, in the last uh, chapter of the book and the tools of cooperation. But I think knowing when to use which tool of management or leadership to move a group forward uh, is, is incredibly important. And the best leaders, either through intuition or through you know, deep reflection and study, seem to know how to do that. Yeah, I love, I love all of those. And offline, maybe we can talk about creating a, an even bigger list of, of behaviors that yeah. leaders can rely on because uh, it's one thing to have the vision and it's an entirely different thing, as you just said, to lead people within that context toward it. Yeah, actually, just if I if I can, again, you just saying that spurred another thing, so this can be fun. Um, but the, uh, so Clay Christensen was a deeply religious man. Um, so what I'm going to say is through that prism that I want people to hear it. Um, and he always talked about there's two conceptions of God, if you will. One is like the Zeus-like figure that just whenever wants something to happen, shoots a lightning bolt down and it happens. And then there's this other view that's more sort of God perfectly understands all of the laws and, uh, of, of science and nature and the universe and, and slightly tilts them occasionally to get the outcome uh, to occur. And Clay would say, well, the same conception of, of CEOs or presidents or, or principals or school heads or whatever exists as well. There's one that like command and control, I say it and you should do it. And there's another that realizes actually organizations are far more complicated. They have business models or organization models with value proposition, resources, processes, the financial formula or the priorities. And really to get something done, the most thoughtful leaders understand that every single rung of that organization is operating, right? As they believe that to be. And so very carefully tilts and tweaks and, and, and spends time just sort of playing with it so that the laws of gravity and, and scientific nature of organizations unfold, right? According to these rules in predictable ways. Um, but as a result, the art of leadership is much more subtle and at these edges of just tweaking the organization to get a set of events to occur. Yeah. So let's say that somebody, maybe many people on this on the Zoom right now, um, have absorbed that lesson. They've read your book, as I've done. They've, they've underlined things. They've taken notes. And they are ready to leap into leading change at their school. Uh, what's one thing that you would advise them to think about before they take that leap, what's that one last thing that you want to make sure that they're, they have in mind? Yeah, I, I, I would spend one thing. So I would spend time figuring out what's the smallest kernel that you can uh, implement a pilot to um, test and learn if your idea makes sense. So I think a lot of times we get conviction around something without particularly when it's a groundbreaking idea. This is less important if it's just sort of a year-to-year -year incremental improvement. But if we're trying to do something really radical, um, my sense is that we, we should have some humility that we don't know exactly how the world is going to work. And so finding the smallest kernel of a place where you can test an idea, learn from it, and then reflect on that learning. It's basically the scientific method and, and the, you know, and I think what we want our students, our learners to come to understand over time as well. And in that reflection, you make a decision each time as a team, which is, is this something we're going to double down on? Is this something we're going to tweak? Or is this something that we're going to walk away from and celebrate? Celebrate quote unquote failure, because at least we learned before we tried to take the entire school community through a massive change that wasn't going to work. And so really celebrate clarity and testing our hypotheses and learning uh, as an education organization in the smallest possible place. I, I often tell the story of 
how you remember the MOOC craze, massive open online courses and Sebastian Thrun, charismatic individual who started Udacity. And he, uh, he and the governor of California, Jerry Brown, uh, one day came out on the steps of the Capitol and announced some multi-billion dollar initiative to take care of all the gen ed courses at, I think it was like San Jose State University or something like that. And, uh, and it was going to solve all the failure problems and whatever else. And then two years later, they walked away from it because it had been an abject failure, having spent a lot of money and a lot of political capital. And you looked at why it failed. Well, something like 50% of the individuals didn't have access to computers or broadband internet for online courses. Well, that's an assumption you could have tested relatively easy be easily before you went up on the Capitol and spent a lot of money and your political capital to do something. And so finding the smallest way to just quickly test key hypotheses uh, would be the would be a big thing I would urge leaders to do. And then if it doesn't work, aggressively say, we're going to, we're going to try something else. This doesn't mean we're not going to innovate. Innovation is part of our DNA, but we're not going to be beholden to any initiative because it's the thing that we thought was quote unquote, the thing. Yeah. When I, so if I haven't already made it clear to everybody on this call, uh, you need to buy this book and read it. Uh, everything you just talked about, Michael, for me is, is related to the section on discovery driven planning. Yes. And, and I remember very distinctly that when I first read The Lean Startup and then all the literature that, that came after it, um, it was like a paradigm shift for me because I had been involved in, you know, these big plans, like over-engineered waterfall approach uh, planning, and um, you run into brick walls pretty hard that way, as you yeah. just described. Yeah, 100%. Um, so... This also feels like a good segue into um, a, talking a little bit about jobs to be done. And, and just to set some context for folks who maybe haven't yet read the book or aren't entirely familiar with the jobs to be done framework and, and the theory and its application, um, I'll just quote something that you wrote actually, I think last week or the week before for, for Forbes in describing jobs to be done as a, a framework that clarifies that when people are in a struggling circumstance, they're looking for a way to make progress. And so in jobs to be done research, uh, often it seems to me what we're doing is we're, we're looking not just for like some big, huge problem, but in a highly, in a high context kind of way, like what are the struggles that people are experiencing and, and not necessarily try to solve the problem, but, but enable people to move forward, to make progress, because that can often be the thing that does solve the problem farther down the line. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit, or I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, what seems to me to be a, a real dilemma. And that is parents have a certain set of jobs to be done, and you describe those in the book, um, and it's been described elsewhere. And students have a different set of jobs to be done, and they don't always necessarily align. Uh, and again, just for the sake of those on, on the call, um, often what parents want is uh, they, they might have a short-term pain point, like my kid's being bullied at school, um, or they might want to join a values aligned community uh, because they feel very strongly about that. Another job to be done for a different kind of parent might be that they want to develop a well round child, or they might be the kind of parent that has a really clear plan for their kid. And parents can actually have more than one job to be done at any given time, but usually there's one that's in, in that number one slot. Whereas kids, as you point out in your book, Michael, um, Basically, they, they want to have fun with their friends because school is social for them. And secondly, they want to feel like they're growing and that they're making progress. How do you, how do you square or can we, can we square the circle here? Love the question. Let me zoom out a little bit also and just say in general, I think one of the reasons it is so hard to innovate in education is that you're trying, in order for innovation to be successful, people have to uptake it and want to do it. And so you have to understand motivation and jobs to be done is really a way to do that, to understand what motivates someone to actually make a switch and say, this is the new way I'm going to operate, make progress, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That, that's really what the theory is about. And uh, for, for it to work, that means every single stakeholder or constituent that has veto power over it, it has to accomplish a job to be done in their lives. And so you're sort of playing on a six-layer chessboard or something like that. 
and you've got to get the moves, you know, the jobs to line up all the way through that, those six layers. Otherwise you can't sort of drop the, uh, you know, the rook or the pawn right through, through the board and, and, and it go to the bottom and get all of them done. And so I have enormous empathy for the educators on the ground innovating, because I think that's, you're, you're, you're dealing with the administrators, faculty, edu um, uh, excuse me, parents, students, right? Community members in some cases, alumni in some cases, uh, it goes quite deep, right? If you're in a public context, it's it's the public school board, et cetera, et cetera. And all, all by way of saying, you really need to find innovation that aligns to all of those things to really move it forward. If any one of those stakeholders, you're asking them to make a change in their behavior. So macro point of view, you, you've just got to think about it and, and, and make it work at some level. The second observation is, uh, I do think that they are sometimes in tension with each other directly to your point, the parent and, and, and the student. I mean, even, you know, help me follow my plan for my child, especially as they get older, the child may not want to follow your plan for them, right? Or they might not see any choice, but not be super excited about your plan uh, for them, which, which often happens. I, I think this is where, you know, <laughs> Schools need to help bridge the gap, frankly, through education. Uh, sometimes parents have very good reasons for what they want for their kids, and they can see some, you know, see some things that it might be hard in the present moment. And the reverse is true. A lot of times we don't trust kids nearly enough to understand the progress that they're trying to make and, and, and how they're seeing uh, the, the world unfold, right? Um, and so on one hand, there's like a knowledge gap, and on the other hand, there's a empathy gap, I think, of, of us not being in their shoes enough. And uh, I think it's a difficult place, but I, I, I think those schools that really are good at innovating either line up the initiatives to get both done or help bridge the gap through education and help create the change management uh, in some ways so that parents or students can start to understand perspective and, 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 and make progress together and not be swimming against each other. It's a hard role to play, but I also think actually schools do it all the time, intentionally or unintentionally, and it's not to pit them against each other, but I actually think to make the ties tighter between them, to bring them together, to, to create more sense of, of commonality of purpose and that we're all rowing together uh, as we work to, you know, create better lives for all of us. I would love at some point, uh, for somebody out there to test my theory, which is if we solve for the students jobs to be done, then we will, if not entirely unlock access to the parents job to be done, we'll at least create the space for a, a much more, um, rational conversation with parents because when kids are happy, and they're motivated to learn and grow, and parents witness that, um, sometimes they're willing to let go of their plan for their kid or their idea that there's a problem at this school and I need to switch them to another school. Or I couldn't agree more with that. Actually, let's stay on it for a moment, right? Which is that a lot of these tensions occur because there's a struggle. And so then the parents are reacting to the struggle. And a lot of times parents want to solve that struggle <laughs> rather than frankly, let the educational process play out and like lean into it and innovate, but, uh, but it's understandable. Right. And so, and they don't understand maybe the root causes or whatever else. And they have their priorities, things that they're comfortable and not comfortable with things that they want or don't want. And all of those value systems now come into play to your point when a student can show that they're productively making progress in their lives and the school can show that I think a lot of these dissipate, or at least the energy around sort of, you know, there's no school that's going to be the perfect fit for the parent. Like I look at my kid's school and there's a couple of things that I'm uncomfortable with, sure, but they don't rise to the level of friction where I'm so that they, you know, overcome all the things that I love <laughs> that, and, and adore that they do, right, for my children. If I all of a sudden started seeing friction, they weren't making that progress then all of a sudden I'm motivated. All of a sudden now I have a job to be done right in this area. And I want to think about a switch. I don't have a job to be done right now because I'm, I'm satisfied. And, and, and I see that in my kids. Yeah. I'll say one last thing and then we'll shift our focus to systems and models um, without having access to the jobs to be done framework because it hadn't been invented yet. Many, many years ago, 
uh, former president of NAIS, Pat Bassett, said that basically parents send their kids to independent schools for one of two, well, for two reasons, really. Uh, one is they want their child to be known and they want their child to be cared for. And I think the second one kind of breaks down along the lines of, you know, making sure the kid's happy. And the first one breaks down along the lines of, yes, they're known. And that, that part of that is we know how to help your, your child to grow. Um, so I think there was some innate wisdom in, in his approach, and it seems to map onto your research on what on what students need. We could probably spend all day talking about this, but because we could geek out for a while on that we one. We could, yeah, we could. Um, but let let's shift our focus to systems and models. And I read something really interesting recently um, that characterized the education system as like we should think about it like in, the, in as a full stack of services in the same way that. Um, and technology companies think about the full stack of technology services that are required to deliver a product or a service. I'm not sure I'm, I, well, I'm certainly not in love with the metaphor and I'm not sure it even entirely makes sense, but you know, to the extent that some models are, you know, all of them are wrong, but some are kind of useful. Um, this writer said that, that um, homeschooling and, and micro-schooling are ways of taking a, a layer of that stack of education and pulling it out, disintermediating it so that parents don't have to go through a school system anymore, um, that they instead can go directly to a provider of a micro school or, uh, or even a, you know, um, a digital platform for homeschooling. And, um, and I'm curious if that framing resonates for you and, and what other thoughts you might have about that, because you do write a lot about micro schooling and homeschooling. Yeah, it, look, this is a trend that I've thought a lot about since I was on the NAIS board, frankly, uh, uh, which is our micro school is going to prove disruptive to not all, but many independent schools. And I think the answer is in many cases, yeah, they, they do resemble a lot of that those disruptive innovations. That doesn't mean they'll be successful, to be clear. But uh, in, in this sense, I think, which is that um, and, and so maybe I'll change the metaphor a little bit, but which is that uh, a lot of families that choose micro schools or choose an online platform so that they can homeschool are effectively saying, I'm overserved by your full suite of services and wraparound supports. And you can call it a full stack if you want. I, I, I tend to view it as a circle, but like, you know, all these things that you do for my child, they don't need all that. What I really want is a customized day, let's call it, of a set of activities that I have a lot more autonomy and choice over, right? Like I don't want your music class. I'd rather that they took violin lessons that I've selected. Uh, I don't need your PE. I'd rather that they did the sport that I chose, right? And by the way, great in high school that you have all these other sports, but I, actually mine's not a team sport. It, it's this and I want it that way, right? Um, on and on and on down the list, right? And, and the academics I want, and in this flavor, I want these courses, you don't offer that. And so they're, they're basically saying I'm overserved and I want a more customized version that's affordable for me. So I could still get the customized thing if I went to your school, but now I'm paying a lot to have that full schooling experience that I only really want 20 or 30% of. And I'm also customizing all those things around it. And, and I think for some families, that's the phenomenon and micro schools are, are getting better and better in the sense that uh, they're figuring out novel ways to plug into their communities and create these choices so that families feel like they can navigate all of the things that a community in our online world have to offer and, you know, pick and, and mix and match. And it's not as good to be clear as the integrated, thoughtfully coherent, you know, independent school experience but it's less money and I get greater control over it. And I think you see a lot of parents making that choice right now, not just in terms of independent schools, frankly. I mean, the biggest growth is away from district public schools, but it's the same phenomenon. They're saying, I don't need all the tracks and classes and this and that and buildings and facilities and right. I, I want the version for my kid. And so I think that's where micro schools fit in and they don't do large percentages <laughs> of what a school importantly does for many families, but it's because those families are saying, we have other ways to fulfill those things. And we're willing to take the trade-off in terms of the raw 
value or quality, if you will, of them um, for something that is more customizable. And this is something we see in lots of sectors, right? Like, you know, the, 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 the people back in the 1980s that opted to go for an IBM PC instead of an Apple personal computer, it, it was not as good as Apple. I, Steve Jobs, you know, continually to the day he passed away, said integrated is always better. He's right in an absolute sense, but it doesn't mean that the individual sees the world the same way. And so that's where I think the micro schools are sort of playing their role. And the question is, how can they get better over time at, at connecting families and helping them navigate uh, this set of services? And if they're able to, then I think they could be disruptive uh, to uh, you know, expensive independent schools that are perhaps not so selective uh, and are struggling from a, from a financial perspective. Um, and, and so we'll see what happens. This was something I was worried candidly about before COVID. I think COVID gave more breath to it. Yeah. You used a phrase in your response there about plugging in. And, and again, for those who have not necessarily gotten through the book yet, there's a, a great section on the theory of modularity and interdependence. Um, and a, a word that isn't in your book, but I, I know Tom Vander Ark from Getting Smart uses a lot, which is interoperability. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot uh, of very fruitful um, thinking, research, and conversation to be done around what things can and maybe should be modular, uh, and what things are are better done in an, in a fully uh, integrated way, as you said, the sort of the Apple approach to things. And and I, I was interested in particular about your your discussion of um, schools that we might think of as as typically as under resourced, uh, that they they actually probably be, are better served by a fully interdependent model rather than the modular model, because there are so many needs to be met that if you aren't thinking about the entire system and how all those pieces will work together, you might just be adding stuff that is, uh, you're gonna get 10 cents on the dollar for whatever it is that you're trying to buy. Um, so for those in the audience who are thinking, okay, you know, whether it's homeschooling or micro-schooling or other things um, that could be really interesting innovations that could plug into my school, um, or that I could at least riff on. Um, are there any schools out there, when you think of like interesting mental models for schools, like are there any schools out there that would be worth people reading about, maybe even visiting? I, I know, for example, as I said at the start of this, this Zoom, that you and Diane Tavener are close, right? And Summit Schools, is, to me, is a really interesting model. Um, what are the ones that come to, you, come to your mind as, as interesting mental models? Yeah, I, so I think Summit is very interesting to be absolutely. And for those that don't know, they're a, a network of about 11 schools um, uh, throughout California and Washington state that are middle through high school. Uh, and I, I think have done a lot of thoughtful work on combining sort of knowledge-based learning through playlists with projects, uh, with uh, experiences, eight, eight weeks of expeditions per year that in a future class disrupted podcast, we'll be hearing about how they're rethinking that uh, and trying to do an even better job of connecting people to the outside world. But uh, not to steal her thunder, but the, uh, but um, but uh, you know, so I think they're a very interesting model in that. I think from a micro school perspective, Acton Academy is super interesting. Uh, very thoughtful curricular design. It looks very Montessori like in a lot of ways, uh, particularly in the elementary school years but super thoughtful arcs of a hero of a, uh, you, you go on a journey of a hero uh, each year and the projects then sit under that and the knowledge sits under that through digital means. Uh, and it's a micro school, uh, it's very affordable. So how they've made those trade-offs, right? I think is very interesting uh, to look at. Um, I think there's some very interesting, and I'm, I'm just blanking right now on the name of, uh, there's a DC based school that I interviewed. Uh, <laughs> A, a charter. Um, sorry, is there interference there? Okay, just on my end. So um, there's a DC-based uh, uh, charter school that uh, has done some great work on micro schools um, uh, within the schools. So I think they're really interesting to look at. And then, you know, if you want some inform inspiration from the public sector, I think Linz Lindsay Unified School District um, uh, which I talk about in the book, has done some amazing work around personalization uh, and mastery-based learning within a pretty constrained system that is not exactly excited to buy a lot of those things, um, uh, but, but from which we can learn uh, as well. I'll give one last plug, uh, which is I think 
well, two. So Sora schools is, is something on my radar that I'm learning a lot from. And I think big picture learning is another really interesting one. I mean, a lot, you know, high tech high has gotten a lot of the attention and for good reasons, but I think big picture learning with their focus on uh, outside learning and in, in the community is a really interesting model from which to learn. And as the founder, one of the founders recently said to me, I want to create a model where we're not judging how smart kids are, but showing the world how kids are smart. Mm. I thought that was a really neat uh, uh, play on it. Um, and, and so I think they're doing some really interesting stuff as well. I was in a cab in Newark once and the, um, not a cab in a, in a lift and, and the driver had just graduated from uh, a big picture learning school. And so we got to talking about it. I've never been to one, but I've read a lot about them. I follow the, the founders on Twitter and, um, and I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. And, and actually what he, what he described was a lot of what you talk about um, in terms of mastery, which we're gonna come to in a minute, but students feeling like there are these projects that matter to them and they figure out through their mentors and their teachers and their coaches um, at their big picture learning schools, how to, how to, how to make impact in the world. Um, and independent of that, I had a, a conversation recently with someone who's, who's helping them to design um, what they call big picture lifestyle. So lifestyle medicine and nutrition and fitness, also something that you talk about in, in, in From Reopen to Reinvent, um, is tremendously important. Like the social determinants of health actually change the, the degree to which students can learn and then be set on a, on a better trajectory for um, uh, for growth and success in life. And so uh, BPL is, is de definitely on my radar as well. Um, we have just a few minutes to talk about mastery, and then I, I want to have some space for questions from the audience because there, there are already quite a few, and, and we probably won't even be able to get to all of them. But, um, you know, when it comes to mastery, uh, first of all, Michael, what's your working definition of mastery? And then I want to ask a question about the relationship between mastery-based learning and the college admissions process. Yeah, great. Uh, my working definition, and just for those tuning in, I, I view mastery-based learning and competency-based learning as synonyms. I know that a lot of people view them differently. I, I, I take them as synonyms. Uh, and my working definition is that you don't fully leave a concept until you demonstrate mastery of it. That isn't to say you can't set it aside and decide it's not that important for your trajectory, but you never fully leave it in the sense that you don't show that you've completed it unless you're showing mastery of it in effect. Great. So uh, one of the big elephants in the room for education is how do we make uh, mastery-based learning fit with a college admissions model that at least on the surface seems to be very much still driven by, if not test scores, because some are, are test optional or, or test blind now, at least um, the, the traditional approach to giving grades, ranking students, what decile or, or quintile are they in, and um, to the extent that standardized test scores are also still part of the picture, like how does that how does that square or not square with a mastery based approach? Great question. This is the question that, as you know, Jeff Salingo on my podcast about the book uh, uh, presented to me and said, "I don't think this is possible for K twelve schools without higher ed acting." And at one level, I agree with him. That's why I started working in higher ed because I thought we had to change that system uh, to give middle schools and high schools and elementary schools the ability to focus on the right things. And uh, I think in many ways, it's a dependent system, not an interdependent one, a dependent one uh, from uh, uh, from uh, higher ed. So it's, it's an issue. That said, I think there's good news on the horizon in some ways. So one, most colleges and universities have for decades now figured out how to evaluate students from homeschool environments where they did not have ranks test scores in some cases, GPAs and the like. So I think what that suggests is that schools that want to move toward more mastery-based models can spend more time with schools that, by the way, a lot of colleges and universities, like, look, top 150 or so schools inundated with applications, they can do whatever they want, but they're actually also pretty good at evaluating alternative ways of, of, of learning and, and showing mastery and so forth. So kind of don't need to worry about them. But all those schools outside, like go into your community 
create a conversation with those colleges. Hey, we're going to move to the system. This is why we think it's going to be better for you, actually. You can find the right fit of students that are able to demonstrate mastery in a portfolio of work, say, right? Where that you can say like, hey, we really want to take musicians and artists. I'm making this up. And, you know, Babson College, where I live, wants to take entrepreneurs. And we're going to be able to show you actually evidence of real deep work and mastery of those things that are so important uh, for you. And so we're going to figure out these alternative ways of actually demonstrating what a student has known and learned, allow you to figure out how to do financial aid better off those models. Cause that's honestly, honestly, the bigger hiccup. It's not the admissions. It's more the administering of financial aid mm -hmm. that gets tricky for these schools. And it's not frankly needs-based aid, right? It's merit aid when they're trying to climb the rankings. That all changes now too, because we're not ranking colleges on yield rate and selectivity and dollars per student and SAT score and all of these input-based metrics that frankly have, have worked against, you know, equity and some of these broader things that we care about, I think in terms of uh, higher ed helping lift all boats and, 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 and moving students the furthest. So we're going to get to have a bunch of conversations around that and more tightly integrate uh, with those higher ed institutions. And I think there's appetite for it. They've demonstrated that they can do it with homeschoolers. There are organizations like the Mastery Transcript Consortium that have uh, been birthed that are there to facilitate those connections. And so I, 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 I think it, uh, I, I am more hopeful than I think a lot of people are uh, about us being able to create an alternative system that I think works better, frankly, on a bunch of dimensions. One, I think it'll be better for the colleges. They'll get the classes that they want that are better fits for them. Two, I think it'll be better for the independent schools because they will be less in the business of, you know, drilling and killing people into the process of like a, you know, a hundred different extracurricular activities and test scores and yada, 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 and checking all the boxes. That should relax, by the way, to your point, the parent's job to be done <laughs> around follow my plan. And that should give students less stress and more opportunities to make progress and discover their passions and who they are and how they want to contribute to the world, which again, should even further lessen the anxiety of the parents that are creating some of this tension in the first place to your the third or fourth question we tackled here. So I, to me, I think there's a real win, 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 I guess, uh, in this conversation. If we can integrate, we, you, you, you know, you got to think forward, right? And, and bring those colleges into the conversation from the get-go. But I think there's a lot of hopeful signs that they can actually do this and that they'll be thrilled by it. Yeah, I fully agree. And one of the things I was most hopeful about in the development of the Mastery Transcript Consortium was their move to include public schools and not only private schools. Yes, I think that was membership. huge. Yeah. Okay, we could talk for all day probably about mastery-based learning. Um, and again, I'll encourage everybody uh, to not only to get the book, but to focus in particular on that golden thread. But um, we have a little bit of time and there's a number of questions from the audience. Um, and so members of the staff have been culling these from the chat section. I'll try to be succinct. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I'll just start with uh, with the first one that's on, on the screen in front of me here. So there's a lot of discussion about the current uh, low test scores that were actually just um, announced by uh, um, the national something or other. NAEP, yeah. yeah. Yep, NAEP. And um, this person said, I suspect that during the pandemic, a lot of learning took place, but in different domains, particularly around technology use. So um, my thought is not that less learning took place or that there was learning loss, but that the learning took place in unassessed domains. And uh, how, do you, how do you think about that, Michael? Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I think, and, and look, I think all these things can be true at a time, right? That we shouldn't ignore for those who are the, those most marginalized populations in our society, real harm and damage has been done in some ways that'll be, we, we shouldn't sugarcoat. And I think that they learn some things that we are not capturing or assessing. And when they are in our schools, I think we ought to start with the conversation, not gee, how much we have to remediate you or how much we need to fix you or how much loss you've had, which is not motivating for anyone, but instead start with the, what have you learned? What do you want to learn next? And start to create a cycle of success and progress for these learners to lean into it. And again, acknowledging that part of that is our goals. We want them to read better. 
well, it turns out that reading, you know, once you've mastered the, the, the skill of reading, uh, it, it becomes much more about the knowledge base that you learn and, and, and how deep and wide and the coherent bodies of knowledge you learn. Well, let's lean into that through the things that grab them at first and then pull that thread to bring them to a bunch of other areas, right? Like, but let's do it in a way that's building off their intrinsic motivation rather than telling them how bad they are. And so I think both can be true that, that kids have learned a lot. Kids have also endured a lot and we have to be sensitive to that trauma and those challenges. And there's some things that they need to learn. And so how do we unite these things to, to really, uh, uh, view it as a strengths based perspective as opposed to a deficit one. Yeah. And of course that brings us back to the, the question of mastery or competency based learning because within that system, it's much easier to do. Well, by the way, if you were mastery based learning from the get go here, right, a student would come into you and you would start to say, what have you mastered? <laughs> and then, and it would be checkered, right? It wouldn't be linear in, in any way, straight way, shape or form. And you'd be like, oh my goodness, that's a really big hole there. That's going to be critical in, in a year from now when we introduce you to X, right? We ought to spend a little time on that. That whole there, not that important, right? It, it, like it's it's actually okay that you didn't master that. Um, and so we're going to skate by it. Yeah. You talked a little bit about in that response just now about, you know, the schools that are, are the, the under-resourced ones, the ones that have marginalized communities. And um, I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the question, the, the higher order question of, of bias. So this person asks or writes, there's a fine balancing act between not being all things to all people and discriminating along the lines of implicit biases. So what strategies, Michael, do you suggest for self-policing to keep out our prejudices while serving the best interests of the pupils in the schools? Yeah, I love the question. It's something I wrestle with a lot in the conclusion of the book. Uh, I don't know that I have the answer, but I'll tell you a couple of the thoughts in my head. Firstly, uh, I think in general, we ought to be measuring much more from a value-added perspective and growth-based so that we value the accomplishments of those who come in with the you know, biggest knowledge gaps or word gaps or whatever else into our schools and that that progress that they make counts for more than the child that already mastered it and just showed what they had learned before they even entered kindergarten. Uh, so, so that's one, I think that that can help a little bit. Two, something that comforts me a little bit is that the jobs to be done thinking, which is how I think we ought to be segmenting a lot of this, it does not correlate to race, income, these tr traditional demographic measures that, that we often look at because people's lives are much more dynamic and circumstance-based then those categories, which are very static, are. Those, don't, the, those categories don't help us understand the progress that individuals are trying to make. And so if someone tried to do it based on those demographic static features, which for all the reasons the questioner lists would be unfortunate and bad and illegal, and, and as values-based, we should say that, uh, I also don't think it would work. <laughs> um, and then the third thing, uh, I also think, and I, I make a plea for this in the book, that as we move to mastery-based system, I don't think it should be teachers who are doing the final grades or mastery over their uh, students, that it should be a third or objective set of educators that don't know the race, gender, et cetera, et cetera, of, of the child that are making those judgments. And that to me can can start to attack some of this bias that that is clearly in the system. Last piece on this, which is, you know, the most pernicious form of this historically was the academic track versus the career technical or voc ed track. And those judgments were not made on anything often other than entering circumstance, color of the skin, gender, things of that nature, other noxious ideas. As we move to better incorporate career and technical education as an important pathway in high schools, I think all students should have access to that sort of learning as part of their academics. And then rather than a guidance counselor or a teacher or a school making the choice over where the student should go, I think the student should make that choice. We should help develop their agency so every single child can make that choice themselves in an informed 
educated way. And that'll help in a lot of ways so that it won't be us biasing that, but they, they will, uh, you know, we will be empowering people to make these choices. Yeah. One of the interesting things about uh, middle states is that we have these two commissions, elementary schools and secondary schools. And our secondary school commission includes post-secondary but non-degree granting institutions, which are often career and technical schools. And I, for a long time, I've been convinced that regular schools have a lot to learn about competency-based education um, and, and intrinsic motivation from what we call CT schools. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that Middle State serves that, that segment. Um, I think we have time maybe for one, one question here, uh, one more question. Um, and this is from someone who I think is, is asking about change leadership. And this to me, this is the question I'm the most obsessed with. So um, I'll, I'll state my bias up front in, in picking this one out of the list. Um, this person writes that, that Francis Fry says empathy, authenticity, and logic, whereas Amy Edmondson will say humility will get the team there. What are your thoughts on, on leading the team to change? Ooh, I, so I love Francis and I love Amy. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead with that. Um, and I think the point is right on both sides, right? Which is that as we're building something, let's, let, let, let's do one hypothetical to try to get at it, right? Which is you're the leader, you have the idea, you have your leadership team around you, and you just want them all to follow suit. The one thing I can tell you is that at best, at best, your great idea is half-baked. You need all of these other people around you to bring it into the world and to actually put flesh and muscle and skin and right on and, and, and bone on that idea. And so you all together need to work together to, to build out that vision. That requires humility, number one, that you don't know how all the world works, that you haven't taken into account all the perspectives, yet you aren't able to think through everything because expertise is distributed. Like we, we don't know everything in the world. That's why we ideally as leaders put people around us who are better at certain skill sets than us. Uh, and so that, that gets into the humility and then being authentic about that, sh saying like, this is what I believe to be true. This is what I don't know. Right. And stating those and then aggressive listening. Right. Like, and what I mean by that, and that's empathy to me, which is like, you know, Christian, you say to me, Michael, love this mastery based learning idea. But I think the way you're, you're talking about grading, like, I just don't see that working because of A, B, and C. And then I'm like, rather than give a response, I'm like, let me make sure I understand that. A means X, you know, means these things. So that's why you don't think it's going to interrupt there. And B is this. And C. did I get that right? And you're like 80%, but, and then you give me the 20%, right? And then I try again. Amanda Ripley talks about this in her book, High Conflict, really listening and, and, and not parroting back exactly, but paraphrasing to show deep understanding is critical so that you can see the blind spots and start to work together. And sometimes people just need to be heard before they're like, yeah, I'm ready to go, Christian. Let's go do that. Um, but sometimes they have really good points and skepticism that you would be wise to build into your op. Uh, your offering. So I think it's a yes and on these things as we're building. And then, yeah, there's a certain point where we're going to go full fledged forward. And if we don't have the right team on place, then we probably ought to replace some members and, and go there. But it's a step process uh, through designing the future. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. And Michael, I just want to say a huge thank you to you for your generosity of your time and the incredible insights that you've shared with us today. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for hosting. And thank you to everybody in the audience who participated in the chat section, or even if you were just sitting there uh, silently absorbing, thank you for being here. Um, we're going to send you a survey, and uh, please complete that. That'll be really helpful to us in figuring out how to better serve you going forward. And once again, I just strongly encourage everybody, if you have not already gotten your copy of Free Op From Reopen to Reunion, please do. Um, get a copy of this book. I'm thinking about maybe doing a book club for members. So 
um, that may be an, an additional motivation for you. Uh, and also on the, the Middle States blog, which you can find on our website in the About Us and News section, you'll see, uh, I think I've written five blog posts up to this point, um, all dealing with different dimensions of Michael's book. Um, and I really try to dig a little bit deeper and kind of tease out the implications of what Michael's talking about. So Michael, again, thank you so much. Thank you to the rest of you for being here and we'll see everybody very soon. Take care.